Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's program entitled What You Need to Know, Protection of Trade Secrets. Uh, my name is Rod Satterwhite. I'm a labor and employment partner in the McGuire Woods Richmond office, and joining me from Dallas is my partner, Darren Collins, who's in our intellectual property group. Uh, I'll start with a couple of housekeeping items about the webinar platform itself. Uh, first of all, on your screen, you should see a resources icon. I think it's over on the right, um, and that will give you access to a copy of our presentation. Uh, if you like, you're welcome to save it, download it, print it, uh, follow along during the presentation. Um, second, you'll also see a Q&A uh, feature. Uh, you can use that to submit questions that you may have throughout the webinar. We're going to push questions to the end. Um, we're going to try to cover as many as we can, but we do have a lot of material to cover. If we're unable to get to your question or can't get to questions generally, then we'll make every effort to follow up individually. And you've got both my and Darren's email addresses on this slide. Feel free to email us directly if you have questions afterwards. Uh, last note on housekeeping is we are recording the presentation. Uh, we will circulate a link to the recording and a copy of the deck uh, within the next day or two. Feel free to share that with others um, or keep it as a resource for yourself. That is all for the instructions. Uh, before we dive into the subject matter, though, I'd like to provide a little bit of context about this webinar series that we're doing. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, the McGuire Woods Trade Secrets team consists of over 30 lawyers from across a number of our functional groups. And we found this cross-sectional team to be a, a very effective approach because, frankly, you don't always know what kind of issues are going to crop up in trade secrets litigation. Some cases require us to work with law enforcement authorities, so we have members of our government investigations team. Uh, on the trade secrets team. Sometimes there are data breach issues, so we have members of our data privacy team, um, and so forth. And this helps us you know, get the right people involved in an area of law that can sometimes move very quickly. So this series is the, this is the first in a series of three webinars that is, is, ba is basically designed to take you through the life cycle of a trade secrets dispute. And given both recent legal developments and some fairly significant changes in the way we are working, uh, which I'll get to in a bit, we thought this would be a good time to provide some updated guidance on the topic. Um, today, we're going to talk about protecting trade secrets, uh, including proactive measures and uh, anticipating the kinds of attacks that you can expect uh, about the adequacy of those proactive measures. I'm going to talk about it in the context of the company's relationship with its employees, and then Darren's going to address trade secret protection in the transactional business-to-business -business context. In our second webinar, we'll have a panel discussion about sort of the next step, and that is enforcing your rights when there's an actual or threatened misappropriation of your trade secrets. And then in the third, we'll put on a different hat and discuss how to avoid and defend against accusations of misappropriation that may be brought against you by, by third parties. Um, so that's a quick overview. And uh, with Without any more delay, let's dive into this. Um, and, and not surprisingly, when I say I'm going to talk about the employer-employee relationship, I'm going to be focused on remote working environments because that's essentially what we're dealing with now. Um, but I will start with a little bit of a, of a basic overview, and I promise I won't keep it too basic for too long. But um, to make out a trade secrets claim, you've got to prove that you own a trade secret. Uh, and to prove that you own a trade secret, you have to meet a, basically a four-step uh, definition. This is, you know, it varies a little bit from some states to others, but this is generally the case. And that is that you have to show that you have information that derives independent economic value from the fact that it's not known in the industry. And you have to show that that information is subject to quote, reasonable measures to protect it. And reasonable is a term that lawyers can play with all day long in its own context. But when you're talking about trade secrets, reasonable means reasonable under the circumstances. So it is an especially fact-specific analysis that can change depending on a number of factors. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of those. But the gist of this in the context of trade secret litigation is that you will be second-guessed if you are a trade secret plaintiff. It's a bit of a game of hindsight. And, and the way trade secret litigation often plays out is that the plaintiff has a good story to tell. 
the plaintiff can describe how they've worked hard to develop information that has value, how that information was stolen, and how it's being used unfairly against them. And that's that's a juicy story if it's done right. In contrast, if the defendant can't really refute that story and if the theft has actually taken place, then the defense often presents a more technical defense, and it will pick at the elements of a trade secret, whether or not it's it's actually publicly known, and whether or not it's been subject to reasonable measures under the circumstances. So you you can expect that if you prosecute a trade secret claim, and if it's a if it's of a high value, then you can expect that defense counsel is going to come after these reasonable measures, and and look at it from hindsight in arguing things that you could have done and should have done, but failed to do. So when we talk about circumstances, what am I talking about here? And this is only a, a small sample of the types of things that a court will look at to determine whether your behavior was reasonable under the circumstances. How big is your company? Uh, how, what kind of resources do you have? What is the, the sensitivity of the alleged trade secret? Are we talking about research and development? Are we talking about a singular secret formula that forms the crux of your business? Or are we talking about a customer list that may have value but may not be uh, along those lines? Uh, what's the nature of the work? Is it is it uh, scientific, developmental, technical, or are we talking about more of a sales environment? How vulnerable is the data, and how uh, what kind of tools are available to the employer or to the company to protect it? And again, just a few of the types of things that a court will look at, but even across this group of five, you can see that remote work has an impact on this, the circumstances that courts will look at in determining what's reasonable and not reasonable. And this is my obligatory statistical remote work slide. I tried to find a, a fairly reliable source that, that, that wouldn't be too extreme. This is from a Forbes article back in February pointing out that before the pandemic, 4% of all professional jobs in North America were performed remotely. By the end of the first year of the pandemic, it was up to nine. By the time the article was published, it was up to 15, and the prediction is that by the end of this year, it will be up to 25% of professional jobs being performed remotely. And so this is obviously going to have an impact on the analysis of how you protect your trade secrets. Now, I said the article wasn't extreme, but there was a quote in there that suggested that this was the largest societal change since the end of World War II. That might be a little bit over the top. But the, the, the point here is that circumstances that may have been novel or may have existed in sort of a crisis mode at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, when people were sending workforces home to work from home for the first time en masse, you know, those circumstances are now becoming normal. We're two and a half years into this. So whereas a court may have excused a failure in protective, in protective measures you know, back at the beginning of the pandemic, those expectations are evolving and, and are less likely to be excused at this point because you know, what was novel is, is now normal. Um, so we've, we don't have a lot of case law, uh, but there is some that has evolved during the pandemic and that gives us a little bit of guidance on how employers are going to be held accountable for the reasonable measures that they, they do or don't take. So in the remote work context, there are sort of three buckets of areas of vulnerability. Uh, one is how remote workers communicate with their employers and with each other. Uh, two is the security of the employee's remote workplace, whether it be a you know back porch, kitchen, or basement. And then three is how do you handle circumstances surrounding the separation of employment. Um, and and I'll, we'll dig into these a little bit more in in, in, a, in a second. But just generally, the context here is that if you disclose information to the wrong person and they don't have an obligation to protect it, then you lose your property right to that trade secret. And in the communications arena, the first area that I want to talk about, not surprisingly, is video conferencing. It's obviously become far more prominent in a remote work environment. And there are a, a number of reasons for that, not the least of which is simply that video conferencing has aspects that employers cannot 
completely control with technical means. And so a couple of the areas that are, are more prevalent are concerns about unauthorized access. And, and I know we had at the very beginning of the pandemic, there were a couple of instances of people hacking into Zoom calls. You know, that, that's not something necessarily that, an, that a company or an employer can control. What I'm talking about more is, is are there procedures in place to prevent unauthorized access? And one example is the waiting room to allow you to screen people and make sure that you don't have the wrong people being brought into uh, into a Zoom meeting or into any, any video conference. Another example is uh, what's in the background. Uh, are there whiteboards? Are there documents that are visible? Can somebody screenshot the, uh, the video and end up looking at a document that you, you later make contend contains a trade secret? Um, and I know that that sounds a little extreme, but I had a video deposition where the witness was. Uh, this has nothing to do with trade secrets, but it, the witness, uh, the entire background of the witness's video screen consisted of nothing but memorabilia from the rock band Kiss, and it got me to thinking a little bit about you know what can be visible in the background and. Uh, unfortunately, what a jury might see if that video uh, gets played during trial. So it's it's something to think about. Another area is screen sharing. If you if you end up uh, sharing your screen, what other apps are open? What other documents may be open that may inadvertently be disclosed? Uh, obviously, overhearing conversations. If you are just using your computer speakers or or if the employees are using tablets, uh, we had a witness prep session um, again last week in which a professional seasoned witness. Uh, got on a prep call with us from a cubicle and you could see people milling around in the background and we ended up having to reschedule it because of concerns about confidentiality and and frankly maintaining the privilege so it's it's still an issue it's not something that that people have gotten beyond and then uh, again perhaps a little extreme but there are a lot of devices in people's homes that have microphones in them and and Alexa and Siri and I've probably just triggered a bunch of those on people's uh, in in people's workplaces sorry uh, baby monitors that kind of thing those need to be at least taken into account and then finally recording and distributing the video call all of these are potential technical vul vulnerabilities of video conferencing and I'm not suggesting that in order to preserve a trade secret, you have to be able to eliminate all of these risks. What a court's going to ask and what a defendant is going to probe is, do you have a remote work policy? Do you have a confidentiality policy? And do those policies somehow address these issues? If I convey nothing else today, it's that level of precaution and preparation that we're recommending. I'm not saying that you have to eliminate everybody's whiteboard in their home office. I am saying that it's a good idea for you to have a policy that tells your employees to take those kinds of issues into consideration. That's what's going to determine whether or not your behavior is, is reasonable. Um, and lest you think I'm being nitpicky, um, there are courts that support my position. One of them is the Delaware Chancery Court, which is a very common place to see trade secrets litigation. Uh, and, and this was a case fairly early in the pandemic. It, it uh, was decided in August of 2020. It was a franchise trade secret case, and the franchisor, franchisor was the plaintiff. They used video calls to market their franchise to potential franchisees. They claimed in the lawsuit that a competitor misappropriated their methodology, and, and to not bury the lead too much here, the court concluded that on some of those calls, the plaintiff had actually shared some of the trade secrets at issue. So we all know that you're dead in the water at that point anyway, if you've actually disclosed it. But the interesting part about this decision is the court went on to address the methodology by which the plaintiff handled those Zoom calls, and that is instructive. Um, they concluded that there were no trade secrets at issue because the, the plaintiff did not take reasonable steps to protect them, including using the same meeting code for every meeting that they had, not requiring people to enter a password, not using the waiting room feature, uh, which I talked about. And the result was basically anybody who got the code could share the code with anybody else. And there were no controls over who set in on these meetings in which the alleged trade secrets were discussed. 
The other criticism that I think is important to take into account is that the plaintiff didn't follow their own procedures. And, and if any employment lawyer has ever given you any advice, that advice probably is the worst thing you can do is have a policy as a company and fail to follow it. And that's what happened here. The policy said they're supposed to take role at the beginning of each of, one of the video calls and weed out the people who didn't belong, and they didn't do that. And so as a result, there were 20 mystery contestants uh, who couldn't be identified, but there was a record that they had sat in on these calls in which the alleged trade secrets were, were discussed. And so if you don't know who they are, it's kind of hard to prove that they signed a non-disclosure agreement and end result, no trade secret, no injunction. Um, so the courts will uh, second guess and scrutinize some of the measures that you take to protect video calls. A, a second area of um, sort of a second employee communications trend that we're seeing is a substitute for, I guess the easiest way to describe it is, is water cooler conversations. You know, you're standing at the coffee pot with somebody. If you're in the office physically with them, you're either talking about work-related issues or maybe personal issues. That has diminished as a result of the increase in remote work. And there was a, early on, there was a, in the pandemic, there was a study of Microsoft workers and the conclusion, not surprisingly, was that in order to fill that casual communications Gap. Employees were turning more and more to what's called asynchronous communication, which we all know as things like emails, texts, and, and instant messaging to fill that gap. And again, that's potentially all well and good if it's, a, if it's an employer system and if it's got specific controls and if, the, if it's got a level of security that you can defend. But if employees start using async communication platforms that you don't control as an employer, like texting or outside IM software or uh, you know, IM apps or social media like LinkedIn messaging, then as an employer, you, you lack control over the security of that. And if you, uh, you know, you, if, if the employees are discussing things that you later claim as a trade secret, you're going to have a problem defending the fact that you let them do that without any kind of, without exercising any kind of control. And again, when we're dealing with these kinds of public platforms, if you start posting or, or if you allow trade secrets to be posted on them, then you lose your, your uh, right to those trade secrets, your property right. So uh, back to my theme that you don't have to be perfect, th we do suggest that in light of this communication trend, you think about reviewing and adapting your policies and practices to reflect that this is, this is the new reality, that this is the way your employees are communicating with each other um, and, and potentially doing so outside the scope of your systems. So the next issue on communications is the use of, use of personal devices. And again, no surprise here that employees use personal devices to work remotely. There was a big scramble at the beginning of the pandemic where some of my clients didn't have enough laptops to distribute to all of their employees. And when they sent them home, they had no choice but to allow them to use their personal devices. And that creates a whole host of, of at least questions, if not issues. You know, do those devices have virus protection and appropriate firewall? Walls, and do they have secure connections back to the back to the office or back to the employer servers? Uh, do they have passwords that are uh, appropriate for the level of security that you want? Or are we talking about a computer in a kitchen that's shared by both the spouse and the children? I mean, those types of questions lead to at least the uh, the need to analyze whether a company needs additional precautions. And again so that you don't think this is me playing the role of Chicken Little, there is case law uh, to support what I'm saying. This is an interesting case uh, for a number of reasons, this DM Trans versus Scott. First of all, it's very recent. It was decided in late June of this year. Second, it came out of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which is known to be a fairly friendly plaintiff jurisdiction for trade secrets cases. I mean, the Seventh Circuit is the jurisdiction in which the inevitable disclosure doctrine essentially originated, and, and it's a fairly friendly jurisdiction to bring a trade secrets lawsuit. This was not so friendly uh, for this plaintiff. The, they were a software company, sued six of their former defecting employees and their competitor that the employees went to work for, claimed that certain customer information had been misappropriated. Um, and this involved the employee's use of personal devices. Um, when the, and when the, just like a lot of people, when the pandemic started, they started working from home and they used their personal devices for that purpose, including accessing the information, in this case, that was alleged to be a trade secret. 
importantly, just the fact that they were allowed to use their personal devices was not a subject of criticism by the court. What was criticized is the fact that there was almost no follow-up and almost no control over that use of personal devices. For example, the human resources department at the company conducted exit interviews of these six people without asking them to fork over their personal devices for inspection without asking them to state whether they had any company data and without asking them to either remove it or somehow return it. And I mean, this was essentially a gaping hole in, in the company's, um, I, I will call it security, but even the use of the word security is a little bit loose there. And as a result, we saw what you would expect to be a fairly friendly court um, literally just, just tore the plaintiff to shreds um, in the opinion itself. And I don't usually put this many words on a slide, but I thought it was at least worth highlighting. You know, they, they blamed the plaintiff's business decisions. Uh, the court said the plaintiff could have prevented the harm by taking greater care. And this third paragraph for the litigators in the crowd, uh, you'll recognize, I mean, this is pretty significant. The court commented that it, sometimes when your reasonable measures are bad enough, then the defendant may be entitled to judgment as a matter of law, and this could be such a case. That's a pretty hard slam um, on a company, especially from a friendly, a potentially friendly court. And basically, you, you, your, your issue there is, is a failure to close the loop on the use of personal devices, not the use of personal devices itself. So the second big area of, of employee vulnerability is the home workspaces. And there's a little bit of overlap here with some of the things we've already talked about, and I'm not going to repeat myself. But once you get into a, a home workspace, then what kind of security does the employee have? Or more importantly, what kind of security do you require the employee to have that you can later use to argue that you took reasonable measures? What kind of Wi-Fi security? What kind of passwords for the personal devices? Is there any kind of policy or practice for when the employee, you know, gets up from the work area and, and leaves the computer unattended? Um, I mean, I know we, we have a policy that talks about leaving, uh, you know, closing out of apps or putting our, our, our computer in sleep mode when we walk out of our offices at McGuire Woods. This is a lot more common when you're working from home and you need to take the kids out to the school bus or, or answer the front door or something like that. What do you do to, to protect your information under those types of circumstances? And then there's a basic physical security question um, and, and a, a question of whether family members or roommates may be you know, meandering through the room and may see something on the screen that they shouldn't see. And then uh, the, uh, techniques like printing, using local storage devices, and using personal email to get the information that you need to do your job or send the information back to the employer is far more prevalent in a remote working environment. And again, like I've, like I've said a couple of times, I'm not suggesting that you need to eliminate the risk in each of these areas, but I'm suggesting that your practices and your communications to employees should take these types of issues into consideration if you want to be able to rely on them in a trade secrets case. Um, and again, there, this was a pre-pandemic decision, but it kind of sheds a little bit of light on that issue. This came out of the North Carolina Business Court in 2016. Um, but again, it, it's, a, it's a similar scenario to what we've been talking about. Trade secrets in question were available to almost all employees without any kind of limitation of who needs to actually see it, which is problem number one. Uh, but it's not a new problem for remote access. Here, there was regular remote access. The employees used their own cloud-based storage and their own email accounts to transmit information back and forth to the company or to store it, like I, I would be using my personal Dropbox account. And the company had no oversight or no restrictions on the employee's ability to do that. So when they tried to argue that this information was a trade secret, the court concluded that it wasn't because they hadn't taken, again, adequate measures to address that unregulated home access. Um, the last topic uh, that I want to cover in terms of the employment relationship is is when people are separated, uh, when they're fired or, or when you know they're leaving. And previously, 
uh, you know, if you suspected that somebody was going to leave and go to work for a competitor, or if you suspected that an employee had been uh, copying information or something like that, you you could take steps to address that. Uh, they would be uh, they would be placed in a meeting with human resources or their supervisor. You'd have security on standby so that you could walk them to their desk and have them collect only their personal belongings and not you know stuff hard drives in a briefcase and walk out the door with them and that sort of thing. And then while that's going on, you can have you could have IT on standby to immediately terminate their network access. In a remote working environment, life is a little different. Uh, you you have very little physical control over the homework environment, and so you have to think about what policies or practices are you going to put into place to deal with that lack of physical control. How are you going to uh, retrieve your company laptop if, uh, if you get a disgruntled or uncooperative employee? Um, and, and, and is it worth putting additional information or additional, uh, additional terms in a, an employment agreement or a confidentiality agreement that requires the employee to turn over the laptop right away? Same is true of physical files or physical storage devices. Uh, basically, how do you create uh, remote precautions that allow you to emulate what you used to be able to do when the person was physically in the office? And there is uh, there's a, a, a good deal of technology technology that's available to help with this situation, but you know, if you don't explore it and you don't implement it, then you're not going to be able to claim that it's a reasonable measure. You can implement remote lockout and deletion on company devices that basically says when this person starts behaving suspiciously, we can lock them out of their tablet, we can lock them out of their laptop, or we can remotely wipe that hard drive. Uh, there's also access tracking software that allows you to set up alerts if somebody decides to download 10,000 documents at midnight uh, to their local hard drive. That's usually not a sign that they're hard workers. It's usually a sign that they're getting ready to bolt. And so you can set up traps for situations like that. And again, you know, some of this may be justifiable from a financial standpoint or an administrative standpoint, but if you don't at least consider it, then this is, these are the types of areas that somebody may go into uh, to try to prove that the, the measures were not reasonable. Always, um, you know, whenever possible with, with separations of employment, you want to remind the employee of their obligations obligations to return material. Uh, you want to remind them if they have a restrictive covenant of any kind, non-compete, non-solicit, or, or a, a confidentiality agreement, that they need to comply with that. Um, and whereas you know, previously you may have been able to have somebody assert that they had this conversation with the employee in person, um, now it's a little more challenging to prove that the conversation took place and that the employee acknowledged their obligations. In some cases, you're going to be doing the exit interview by video. Um, and despite what I said earlier about recording video conferences, this may be a time to consider it as long as you take into consideration that you know some states may have uh, privacy laws depending on where the, where the company is located or where the employee may be located about recording without consent. So you'd need to check on that um, ahead of time. So all of this um, having been said, I mean, we kind of went over the Seventh Circuit decision, which is a good example of how not to do it in terms of employee separations. Uh, just as an example, there is a, uh, earlier this year, there was a case out of the District of Oregon that kind of laid out, a, a, you know, not extensive, but a reasonable set of steps that this employee took to address employee separations and remote work. And that included the, the, some of the things that you've seen and heard long before the pandemic, which is confidentiality agreements, uh, a company-owned, company-controlled cloud-based drive to maintain work product, an agreement and a handbook that both required property return upon separation, and consistent application and enforcement of those requirements. Um, again, I, I can't beat this dead horse enough to say if you're going to have a policy, you want to be able to demonstrate to a judge or a jury that you're following that policy. And then here, uh, the, the Oregon District Court uh, concluded that these measures uh, in this remote work context were sufficient. So a good, a good contrast uh, to the Seventh Circuit decision. So wrapping up, um, I don't think there should be any surprises on this slide, um, but in terms of proactive steps, perfection is not required. 
reasonable efforts under the circumstances are required. And in this case, those reasonable efforts can include at least a dust off of your confidentiality policies and agreements and look at whether or not they incorporate remote work issues. Uh, also, uh, policies, handbooks that deal with both confidentiality and if you if you have remote workers and don't have a remote work policy, uh, you should consider implementing one just so that employees have some guidance on what's permitted and what's not permitted and what's a best practice when you're dealing with a homework environment. And then also implementing some basic security protocols for those for those workplaces. And again, I'm not suggesting that you're going to go to everybody's house and inspect their compliance with these policies, but it's just like a handbook. If you publish a handbook and you have an employee sign the handbook and acknowledge that they've received it, they've read it, they've understood it, and they're going to comply with it, if you've got that signature on a remote work policy that, that has reasonable precautions, then you're going to be able to wave that like a flag in front of a judge or a jury and say, look, we took reasonable steps to address all these uh, idiosyncratic uh, you know, video conference vulnerabilities that, that people are talking about. We did a reasonable job here. And then finally, I would um, examine your exit procedures to see if, if you've got them formalized in a way that can take care of the issues that will come up with, with remote employees. And I'll end on this note in terms of training. I mean, doing the first three are good ideas. They are far less effective if you don't take the time to at least basically train your employees on these issues. Because what you'll see, again, I'm going to the extreme in a bet the company trade secret litigation situation, but the defense will spend the money and the time to depose 15 or 20 of your employees. Ask those employees what are your company policies with regard to trade secret protection. And if you haven't at least done some basic training with your goal being to more or less create a culture of confidentiality, if you haven't done that basic level of training, 20 different people are going to give 20 different answers under oath, and good defense counsel will exploit those inconsistencies. So one, two, and three are good, but you, you magnify their effectiveness if you combine it with a, with a fundamental level of training on these types of policies. So I am uh, out of breath, and I'm going to flip it to Darren, who, as you can see, his slides are going to be a lot more entertaining than mine, um, but I'll leave it to you, Darren. Go for it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about the entertaining part, but uh, yeah. So just to start out, and I've kind of titled this section, I've never met a trade secret, which uh, is kind of based on, uh, it's, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but based on my experience with trade secrets and transactions, all the ways that you can effectively lose a trade secret. Um, and, you know, as Rod mentioned, a story is very important with trade secrets. And the easy cases are when you catch an employee who has sent 300 emails to their home computer right before they quit and, and taken a thumb drive with all the company's most critical documents um, and gone to start, you know, a, a competitor. Those are the easy cases. The tougher cases are, um, you know, when you don't have that smoking gun right off the bat, or a highly technical case where, you know, you may have some employees, you may have a competitor who had access to information who suddenly comes up with a competitive product, software, um, whatever it might be. Um, I'll tell you about one of my experiences, just as an aside, which, which again, kind of formed my bias early, um, which is, you know, right out of law school, um, I had a computer science and electrical engineering background, uh, expected to be doing patent work, and instead, for the first several years, got put on a very large trade secret case. Um, and, and the reason was I, I knew nothing about the law, but, um, you know, I knew a lot about software and telecommunications, um, had done a lot of research and written a paper on kind of forensic discovery of computers, which was pretty early on at that point. And so I was stuck with the task of working with our technical expert and his team of crack graduate students who were going to go through all the information that we knew of had been disclosed to the competitor um, and figure out what trade secrets are misappropriated. So generally, um, 
as Rod mentioned, you've got you've got information that is is kept confidential, and the standard in most states is that that has value to a competitor, and and that's but uh, by, by it or has value to you by not being known to a competitor, um, which essentially is defining the trade secret. And is anyone who's been involved in these big trade secret litigations, that's a lot of the game. Is is de- what is the trade secret? When does it have to be defined by the plaintiff's counsel? And and then the defendant's counsel trying to poke a lot of holes in it being a trade secret. In reality, on on the plaintiff's side, um, you're trying to figure out what the defendant took, and then you're trying to convincingly argue that's a trade secret. Um, and, and my first task was to marshal this team of graduate students, and essentially we were dumpster diving. So uh, back then, um, everything was printed out. Uh, and everything was thrown away. So we went from the beginning of the litigation, going through dumpsters um, where nothing was shredded and we had all this valuable information and comparing that to information of our client and, and trying to figure out what a trade secret was. Uh, once the, you know, as we got further along into the litigation, everything was shredded. And so the job became a lot less fun. Um, putting together pieces of paper with ketchup and mustard on them to try to assemble final documents to come up with a trade secret so that the people in the other group could um, make an argument that was a trade secret. It it was a big mess. Um, And I went from looking for evidence of trade secret misappropriation in dumpsters to the realization that the new company certainly didn't have any trade secrets because they were throwing everything away from customer lists to performance indicators to source code to literally everything. And so I I came to a different realization after working on that trial, which is, man, um, it's really hard to to keep a trade secret. And that overly long story kind of brings me to my bias and all the ways I see that people lose trade secrets. If, If I go to the first substantive slide, um, it, it's really back to the elements. It's, you know, as Rod mentioned, it's reasonable efforts to protect uh, is the standard that virtually every state uses in some form or fashion. Um, it is subjective. It varies by state. Um, it varies by what's been seen uh, in that state and, 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 frankly, other states. Judges like um, precedent. They like similar facts. They don't like to make the wrong decision. And, and to be quite honest, they're looking for an easy resolution to a trial um, that isn't going to uh, be overruled on appeal. And, and with that as background, you know, it, there's another prong that Rod mentioned, which is um, it's not known in the industry, it's not publicly known, it's not known by competitors, there's a lot of different standards. Um, but if you remember the structured capital case that Rod mentioned, uh, which I think was out of New York, uh, there's a statement that says, look, if something has been disclosed to people who are under no obligation of confidentiality, it's not a trade secret, which is a pretty powerful statement and almost seems to go against this reasonable efforts to protect standard. Um, so in reality, a lot of judges will use that almost as a shortcut to the reasonable efforts analysis. If they can find something that says, hey, this this is in fact public now, it's not a trade secret, Um, they kind of conflate the reasonable efforts prong and the not known in the industry prong. Um, And so that just emphasizes how important it is that you don't have those situations, that you don't have a situation where a judge can say, oh, these people obviously disclosed this. Um, It wasn't disclosed under confidentiality. It's no longer a trade secret. Um, So that's a way that that we look at these things and that judges look at these things. But in general, on transactions, there's lots of different areas where those trade secrets can go down the toilet. Um, And the slides are, I think, a little bit behind the speaking on this. But um, if you look at the stages of a transaction, and I'm going to use, for my example, an acquisition, an M&A type transaction, although frankly it applies to almost any you know, corporate transaction, commercial transaction you can think of. At the at the first stage, you typically have an LOI, an MOU, a term sheet, 
with confidentiality provisions, sometimes an NDA precedes even those. But the point is you're exchanging preliminary information to try to get interest from a purchaser. Second stage, diligence. The purchaser is, is trying to find out if financially, operationally, legally, the business is as it's advertised to be. And then you have the transaction documents. What are the terms of the purchase? What is the risk uh, apportionment between the buyer and the seller? What is the, uh, you know, what is the purchase price? What are the expectations? What are the assets? Um, all of those things um, are, are typically in a purchase agreement. And then you can have other ancillary documents on services, on supply arrangements that may last past the closing, uh, something as simple as a transition services agreement. And then you have after closing. Okay, the deal's done. Um, you know, what are the first steps you take? And, you know, if you're a private equity client, for example, you may be looking to sell the investment in five years. What do you need to do between the transaction closing and trying to, you know, sell the company and, and make a profit? So I'm going to take those areas in sequence. The first one is kind of the NDA, LOI, um, MOU, whatever you want to call it stage. And the first general mistake that I see, um, and it cuts both ways, is, is the term of the NDA. Private equity firms in particular and acquirers usually like to have a short period of confidentiality. Um, they don't want to be tied up if the investment doesn't work out. Uh, they may have other uh, companies, um, portfolio companies that are in the same industry. They don't want it to you know, restrict those obligations. So they're very nervous at the beginning about how long this NDA is going to last. The problem with that is unless they're the only bidder, and assuming their bid goes through, you've got other bidders or other potential buyers who are thinking the same thing and signing the same documents. And this is the first most common area I see trade secret protection fail because something happens down the road, three or four years, you know, the company you bought that you've invested in sues someone. And one of the things that, that I look for at least, and the other side would generally or should look for, is the term of NDAs. Because the term of an NDA literally says, at the end of its one year that I've agreed to keep it confidential, this is no longer a trade secret. Nothing you've told me is a trade secret because you've already agreed after a year, I can do whatever I want with it. I can put it on the internet if I want to, and you would have no remedy against me. So I, I don't think people think enough about term. Um, you do have uh, trade secret exceptions. So I'll, I'll jump down to the fourth bullet on this slide. You know, someone will put in something that says, oh, except for trade secrets, you know, those will last in perpetuity or until they're public or a longer term, five years, 10 years, whatever. The problem is that's all they say, right? There's no procedure for marking a trade secret, um, you know, what the other party understands a trade secret is, um, or, you know, categorizing things into a trade secret category versus a non-trade secret category. And as a disclosure, you don't want to do that, right? You want to take the position that everything you're disclosing is a trade secret. And, and some would say there's, there's no difference between something being held confidential and a trade secret. Um, so it, it really muddles the water. Even if you have an identification of trade secrets, the problem is um, that that can create its own problems, right? Because then anything you haven't identified as a trade secret, in a subsequent litigation, someone can say, oh, you, well, you didn't identify that. It must not be a trade secret. You guys must not keep it as a trade secret. And that can cause its own problems. Um, then I'm going to talk secondly about marking and follow up on oral disclosures. And this hits across the board on confidentiality provisions, but particularly on NDAs. Uh, you know, I, I looked at a company in litigation that every single agreement they signed, and they had, I don't know, 300, I think, plus NDAs, had a marking requirement. So naturally, I asked them, okay, so uh, can, can you show me which documents have been marked and which documents haven't been marked? Almost universally, nothing was marked other than presentation level um, information or emails. And, and that's not the way businesses work together. Um, you know, if you have any kind of detailed commercial or even acquisition, you're going to have people talking to each other. You're going to have people exchanging emails um, with documents attached that get re-forwarded, printed out, laying around. Um, and, and 
you know, if you don't have a file backing up what was marked, um, you're going to have a problem enforcing those as trade secrets. The same thing for oral disclosures, even worse. You know, anything disclosed orally is the typical requirement of an NDA. Has to be follow-up in writing so that the other side knows it's confidential. So if we talked about trade secrets for an hour at this meeting, you, after the meeting you need to follow up and send a list of what you consider to be trade secrets. That's what the NDA requires. You know, again, 300 plus NDAs, I asked them for their file that showed all their written follow-ups to oral disclosures, and they had never done one. In 20 years, despite this being in their form agreement, they had never sent one single written follow-up. Obviously, that's going to be a problem when you're forced to sue someone for trade secret and misappropriation and argue that you've taken reasonable measures. You know, something to note here, none of these by themselves are fatal. And I think Rod, this is something Rod basically alluded to. What a judge will look at is the circumstances as a whole. But from a defendant's point of view, this is really death by a thousand cuts, except it doesn't really take a thousand cuts. If you create question on four or five of these areas that uh, the plaintiff has not been doing adequately, it starts to turn the story on its head. Uh, these people weren't careful. Uh, their form NDA literally had a two-year term on everything. Everything the companies ever disclosed ceased to become a two-year, a, a trade secret after two years. So, you know, courts look at these things individually, but again, it's all about telling a story. Diligence. So, second stage is diligence. I've already mentioned the other bitter problems in the NDA. That continues here. Uh, you've got a data room. Um, a lot of times, you know, the data room will be made available pre-bid. Uh, you may have five, six, ten bidders all looking at the data room. Um, these bidders all sign NDAs. So one issue we've talked about is um, the, the term of those NDAs. And it's just an example. You don't know what terms the other bidders signed up to in NDAs. Um, I, I increasingly asked for those NDAs to be posted to a data room. Um, if you're, you know, the winning bidder, if you will, um, that's going into full diligence. But, you know, most of the time they aren't. But that's something you need to understand because that has already impacted the value of the trade secrets you're buying and, and frankly, whether or not you have trade secrets. Data rooms, and I'll kind of group this with the next one, outside experts. Um, data rooms are, you know, something I see that, that's a problem. As we alluded to, there's other bidders. Um, I think people have gotten smarter about it. You've started to see a lot of two-stage data rooms, but that's kind of a new phenomenon. Um, ideally, what you would have is you would have a data room that had surface level information, financials, things like that, that other bidders would be able to see. And then you'd have, quote, trade secrets, more, more sensitive information that you hold back and you don't disclose until you get the final bidder. I mean, that's more difficult to do in practice than, than you would think. Um, but that's, that's certainly a step in the right direction because everything in these data rooms that the other bidders have seen who may be competitors, um, may have sour grapes and started competing business down the road, um, that, can be, that should be a, a big concern um, and, and it's certainly a concern from a trade secret perspective. The second thing is you have to think about the spider web that these data rooms cr create. You're not only talking about the bidders and their counsel, you're also talking about their outside experts. So their tax experts, their accounting experts, their IT experts, everyone who has access to those data rooms. Um, and you look at those and you don't know not only the agreement that the target has with the bidder, but the agreements that those other bidders have with their subject matter experts, their outside experts. And if there's a deficiency on any link in that chain, which is really a big spider web, then you've potentially got an issue with the trade secrets that you thought you were paying so much to acquire. In reality, um, you, you may not, those may have been disclosed, again, going back to the structured case, uh, without an obligation of, funk, of, of confidentiality because you don't know what, if any, agreements the other bidders have with their subject matter experts and their outside advisors. Um, 
even if they do have agreements, I see this all the time in NDAs with private equity firms, they don't want to commit in the agreement to having a written contract with their advisors. They want to instead inform their advisors of the confidential nature of the information. Well, again, informing advisors does not create a confidentiality obligation, and that can be a big hole for trade secret protection, particularly if you've done it 20, 30 times. Um, the other thing that we see is management calls, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on that other than to say that everything that Rod talked about with uh, web conferences and video conferences and just having telephone numbers of people attending management calls, if you don't know who's on the call, you're going to have a really hard time enforcing anything that was disclosed on that call as a trade secret. Diligence questionnaires. I always have a big issue with these. You've, you've got the target, and, and they're not an IP attorney, and they're going through, and you have the business person at answering a diligence questionnaire. And it says, please, you know, disclose IP held by the company, or, you know, please identify trade secrets held by the company. And I, on almost every single one of them, they just put none. They don't know what a trade secret is, per se. Um, but now you've got the owner of the company, the founder of the company, the management team of the company basically saying, I have no trade secrets. And you go on to buy that company. And that's, you know, again, an, another cut that the defendant has, another potential issue with claiming trade secrets. Let's go to transaction documents. So, and, and again, I'm kind of using an acquisition and M&A document as a model here. Um, if you go to the IP section of the documents, you will typically have a disclosure rep. And for some reason, somewhere along the line, someone who represented a buyer thought it would be a great idea to put a bunch of gotchas in there to require the, the seller to list every single piece of IP that the seller has, not just registered IP that's public, but trade secrets. And so you'll see disclosure reps saying, list all intellectual property owned by the company and they will 99% <clears throat> of the time never list a trade secret. And so again, the implication there, because IP is defined to include trade secrets, is there are none, similar to the diligence response. Sometimes they'll actually schedule trade secrets. In some ways that's worse, because um, if they schedule, let's say two things, um, then you're essentially limited to enforcing trade secrets, at least that predate the transaction, arguably to those two things. Um, they haven't, certainly if you're in, trying to enforce a trade secret on item X and that's not disclosed, um, you know, again, it's, it's definitely another one of the thousand cuts that, that the Fins Council can use against you to claim that there wasn't a trade secret. Um, and, and that obviously ties to the scheduling. Um, you got to warranties themselves. Uh, the problem with, warranties and, and again buyers trying to be overly aggressive they'll define trade secrets as all data and information um, which is not an accurate description of trade secrets um, can indicate to a court that the seller really didn't have any idea of what a trade secret was and what it took so it can actually hurt a claim um, it, it can also hurt a claim because if you if there is no warranty on trade secrets, uh, you know, a, a defendant can make the case that you didn't own this company until three years ago and you really have no information at all. The founders are long gone. Um, you know, the old management team is gone. What did you do before you bought it? Um, you know, having reps in a purchase agreement can at least allow you to say, look, we have a rep from the seller. <clears throat> that they were keeping things as trade secrets and that, you know, going back to it, it's reasonable um, to assume uh, that they were taking reasonable efforts. If you don't have anything in the agreement on trade secrets, you're kind of left with the problem of, yeah, we actually have no information on what happened before, not even a rep on it. Um, employee confidentiality reps. Um, I'll mention this one because it comes up a lot. There's a provision that says all employees have signed confidentiality agreements with the company. Um, and the company uh, will take that, but they'll schedule exceptions. They'll put 22 people's names down who haven't signed NDAs. It, you know, it's reality. They haven't signed them. 
um, in, in, instead of saying, hey, but there's an uh, uh, employment handbook and that has confidentiality, they'll just say, no, these people haven't signed agreements and the agreement will stay like that with the disclosures through cl closing. And then a smart defendant will say, oh, there's 22 people who don't. When you think about what those 22 people did, who they talked to, water cooler conversations, it's not reasonable that this company had any trade secrets at all. So that's something to think about. You, disclosures on scheduling, tying them to warranties. And, and then you've got ancillary arrangements. Um, you've got TSA, supply agreements, development agreements, and I'll just mention a couple things here. TSAs, um, you know, I've seen so many of these where the provision says the standard NDA language. The party disclosing owns the information and the receiving party won't, you know, disclose it. Well, the problem in a TSA and frankly a lot of these agreements, supply agreement, development agreements, um, is they're performing a service for the other party. So that's not what the definition of confidentiality should be. The, the confidentiality definition should, you know, the recipient should own that all the confidential information resulting from the services, and yet that's omitted. And again, when you get into a trade secret claim, um, if you don't even have the right owner identified, or if the defendant can claim you're not even the owner of the trade secret, good luck with enforcement. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out around transactions and the ancillaries is this is not just the documents. You have to think about, <clears throat> to Rod's point, how does the company work? Do they have policies? Um, a lot of people don't do site visits. Um, site visits are very important, especially if they have an outside developer, an outside manufacturer. Even going to their offices, you can glean a lot from a site visit just by seeing how they treat confidentiality, um, how buttoned up they are, or you know, obvious gaps that you see. So I'm going to go to post-closing, which is the last really substantive area here, and some issues that come up. The first one has to do with employees that do not transition. Um, invariably, people do not think they need employment agreements, NDA agreements assigned for those people. In reality, those are the people you need them assigned for most, or at least a covenant for the seller to enforce them, um, because those are the people who don't transition, who are most likely going to create problems. Um, they may lose their job at the seller. They may have no job because of the transaction. Um, those are people who are likely to lash out and people who you want to be able to most enforce confidentiality agreements against. If you don't have those and you don't have any ability to enforce or compel for the former employees, a court can say, look, you, you essentially have no ability, even if something doesn't happen, it's a gap, but certainly if something does happen and you don't have any ability to enforce a trade secret against those folks because you don't have the confidentiality agreement or certainly a weaker position of enforcement, that can be a big issue. So you need to get that assigned. And I'm going to skip to the third bullet, <clears throat> which is third party NDAs, which is really the same point. Um, have them assigned even if they're not material agreements. Um, you, when you have an acquisition, relationships change. Personal relationships of vendors with the owner are over. Um, you know, you've got suppliers or manufacturers that may decide they don't like working with a new acquirer. Uh, things can unravel, and and you want to make sure you have the protection of those NDAs. Going back to the bidder situation, other bidders. Those are the main agreements you want to get assigned because those are the people most likely to hurt you. Uh, we had a case here recently where uh, a bidder who did not win the bid reached out to our entire, the entire sales and engineering team that we had just purchased and started hiring them. Um, and we did not have those bidder agreements assigned to the buyer. They were still held by the seller. And so luckily we were able to deal with that um, but there was a definitely a panic moment. Um, so, so think about at the end of the transaction, not only the, the documents that are relevant to operating the business going forward, but the ones that you need to protect trade secrets. Retiring owners is another great example. Um, they are looking to do something else. You need to make sure, and, and most people are pretty good about this on the document front, 
But I would encourage a very frank conversation, which I found to be very, very uh, helpful with retiring owners, founders, around the non-compete and, and confidentiality. What are they thinking about doing next? Let's get on the same page so that we don't have a dispute and we don't have a misunderstanding. And those conversations can be very effective in heading things off before they become issues. So I think that can be very important. But in general, post-closing, you're trying to fix all the issues you found during diligence. You're trying to tighten up the NDAs, make the, make the third-party agreements better, um, and, and prepare for exit if you're a private equity firm. You, you want to you know, you be able to tell a better story on IP and trade secrets than you had in the beginning. And that goes to you know, the policies Rod talks about, to your documents, to your physical practices, and, and just thinking a little more about, especially for a company that, that has a lot of value in technology or, or things you could argue are trade secrets. Um, that that you leave it in better condition than when you found it because that's only going to help your valuation. Um, the last slide I have is really just a sum up. Um, you know, going back to this is a story, and if you're a plaintiff, you don't want to have the defendant um, go through and find 20 errors in terms of you know your policies, your employee relationships and agreements, your third party agreements. Uh, go back to that prior acquisition that you did and and find a bunch of holes in in those documents and in the processes um, that can derail your what you thought was your convincing story on trade secrets very quickly. <clears throat> Most of these cases are won or lost at the injunction stage, so you need an immediately compelling story, uh, and the defendant knows that, so it's going to try to poke holes in your compelling story. Um, and, and your job really is to minimize, you know, these thousand cuts and, and get the number down as much as you can um, so that, you know, your client doesn't look bad and you can realistically tell a story. And, you know, I'll just put in a, a plug for the other side of my practice, which is the patent practice. If you really have something technical, File a patent on it. Don't rely on trade secrets. In today's uh, highly mobile remote workforce, um, where people switch jobs much more than they did, you know, even 10 years ago, five years ago, um, you know, patents can last, last a lot longer than trade secrets. And you don't have to prove that someone stole it. You just have to prove that someone does it. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a negative outlook on trade secrets from my perspective, practically. Um, but again, you don't have to win all of these. You just have to convince a court that you're using reasonable efforts and hopefully haven't made the agreement or information public. So I'm two minutes over, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and unfortunately, as Rod alluded to, we probably don't have a, a bunch of time for questions, but we will try to follow up with all those in writing. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks very much, and, and we hope you'll sign up for and, and come to our subsequent sessions as well. We appreciate it, everybody.